Pride, we are live. Hello, everyone out there in virtual Facebook land. We are the Flint Public Health Youth Academy, and we are here for another episode of A Youth Perspective. We have a great show lined up for you guys today. We are here with guests from the Future Public Health Leaders Program. The, this particular program is housed at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. And we're excited to talk about mental health as we continue this summer campaign on mental health. And we're gonna do that while learning about what the FLIP program is about and hearing from some of the cluster that I have the, the um, pleasure of mentoring along with Bianca. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So again, I just, you guys wave at our audience. They're out there. They're out there looking at us. So give them a wave. And so we're just excited again to have our guests. We're gonna kind of start off, I'm not gonna do formal introductions because most of you know the, the, the Flint Public Health Youth Academy, but we also have some, some guests today. And as they begin to talk and introduce themselves, um, we're gonna move right into our questions during that time. But we wanna kick the show off by first giving an overview of what the FLIP program is. And then we'll go into mental health, public health, lived experiences, and also share um, what some of the things that the flippers and even some of our fire youth have had to go through to get to college and, while, and the things that they have to endure while they're there in college. So we're gonna start the first segment of this show off by first, I wanna introduce one of my colleagues and mentors, Ms. Dana Thomas from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, who serves as the program director of the FLIP program. She's gonna tell you what FLIP is. That's the acronym for Future, Pu Future Public Health Leaders Program. Um, she's gonna tell us what this program is and then we'll go into some more questions. So Dana, welcome to our show. It's such a pleasure to have you today. Um, and my first question for you is what is the Future Public Health Leaders Program? Thank you, Dr. Key. So the Future Public Health Leaders Program, or FLIP, as we affectionately call it, is a CDC-funded uh, public health pipeline program. Um, so CDC provides funding for us to introduce public health and health equity to underrepresented undergraduate students. Typically, we're a 10-week in-person uh, summer program. This year, we're doing it completely virtual because, you know, that C word, um, the other C word, right? Um, and it is where we introduce them. The students have a field placement. So they're placed in a local Michigan um, public health organization or adjacent public health adjacent organization where they're gaining practical hands-on experience. Um, they have curriculum sessions two days a week with us where they're learning more about and digging a little bit deeper into public health issues, um, talking about health equity, social determinants of health, um, but then also they're learning about skill development, professional development. We're going to have sessions on graduate school, um, resume development. Um, they'll have to do posters. They're doing a research project. They have a community service. They have a completely full summer. Um, and so, but the goal really is, is to develop and create a well-rounded cohort of young people who will have greater exposure to public health and start building that public health network while they're an undergrad. Um, and then we assist them throughout their journey. So that's the program um, next year will be 10 years old. And so we still have folk from our very first cohort who are still actively engaged with the program. And we help them throughout their journey for whatever they need, whether it's advice, whether it's uh, letters of recommendation, whether it's helping them navigate that first job and salary negotiation, whatever it is, we're, we're a resource for them beyond um, them doing the 10 weeks. The 10 weeks covers, and I think this is important because we know for many students who are underrepresented or first gen that um, you can't just take a summer off, right? So you receive a stipend. Um, we cover your housing. So all your housing is, uh, is covered. Um, we cover your transportation. So we accept students from across the nation and the US territories. So we cover your flight to Ann Arbor. Um, we cover, because this is Michigan and we are the Motor City, we provide University of Michigan vehicles when we're in person. We cover that. You don't even have to pay for gas, right? So we cover the gas when you're with us. So we cover 
as much as possible so there's not a financial burden on the student when they are participating in the program. This year, because we were virtual, there were no cars, they didn't get to experience wonderful Ann Arbor. Um, but this year, for instance, we did provide a technology stipend um, to help offset maybe some of the cost students may have. So we really try to be responsive to what the students need um, to really make it an experience for them, because the program is really to build up their, uh, their, their confidence and their skills. We have financial literacy. We have a five session financial, financial literacy sessions. So you're going from everything from credit cards to student loans, how to save and how not to spend or how to spend wisely. Um, we have an embedded mental health uh, uh, coach um, who will work with the students uh, on a variety, whatever they want. We're paying for it. We don't even care who's doing it, right? A student can go as many times as, as, as they need. We know that imposter syndrome is real and many of our students experience it. So that, those are some of the things that we wanna unpack and address with the students throughout the summer. That was long, you, that was more that you probably, that probably answered three questions, right? <laughs> and I, you did answer like three of them that I have for you and that's great. And, and, and you also talked about the importance of having mental health support for the programs because of the different barriers we have. It could be related to gender, it could be race and ethnicity or social economic background, level of family support. There's so many reasons why we have um, so many barriers and stressors. And so having that mental health support is great. And we're gonna delve deeper into mental health in a little bit, little bit later. But Dana, we wanna ask you something really quick. So in your role as a public health director and manager, what are some of the mental health stressors you encounter doing this work and how do you deal with them? And then we're gonna to transition to the youth. Oof, oh, yeah, ah, that's gotcha. a good one. <laughs> um, I, I do wanna say, I wanna I, I want just point back to the fact that we also have mentors because that's how we have Dr. Key and Bianca Lawrence who also work with the students. So there's multiple touches and I, I wanted to make sure I didn't leave you guys out. Um, wow, so I think that everyone is different and everyone handles stress differently. For me, what has been super important in my career, my journey is that work-life balance um, because the job can, can, can get at you. There's a lot that's kind of happening. So for me, it's the things that I'm doing away and making sure I maintain some things away from the job to keep my mental health uh, in balance. Um, and I think that even in your own personal life, there's stressors, right? So it's things that are not, that you can do that just frees you. I know when we were still in person, we're at home now, which I love, by the way. I didn't think I was going to love it, but that has been helpful for my mental health. Um, and I think is a, um, a, a article was shared today around a New York Times article that said that for women of color, working from home has been a mental health grace for us because we don't have to deal with the microaggressions that occur when we're in the office. And so for many women of color, working from home has actually, they didn't realize how stressed that they were and so they weren't involved in that environment because of the microaggressions, et cetera. So there is that balance now. So thinking about the role that working from home for women of color, you know, it's a double-edged sword. On one hand, they're saying working from home can lock you out from, from promote from promotion, right? Because if you're not seeing forgotten, but on the other hand, from a mental health standpoint, it's done wonders for women of color. And this is also, we're talking about um, women who have the opportunity and luxury to work from home and are in that kind of uh, position. So I wanna uh, recognize that. So I would say that that's an important piece. It's, it's about that balance. Working, I would walk to my car that was my first part of decompressing from the day. And I tried to leave work at work and home life at home, right? Um, and even for working at home, my son said I had to create a space, a workspace separate from my down space. And that was super important. Thank you, Dana. And we appreciate that. So again, right before we get started talking to the FLIP students, we call them flippers. But before we get ready to start talking to the flippers, we want to ask everyone on the panel, make sure you go to Facebook and find this discussion and share it on your personal page 
so that your friends and family can also see, hey, you're on and you're having this wonderful discussion. So um, we have um, a couple of people. So I'm gonna have Cruz get ready to ask um, question one and then Everett can do question two. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Cruz and this, these questions are to our flip cohort um, students, but if any of our FIRE students or any of the mentors have also um, responses, please engage and share your wisdom as well. Go ahead, Cruz. Yep, and when you answer a question, please give like a really short, brief introduction of yourself. So our first question is, how many of you are first-generation college students in your family? Tell us about what that is like are there any pressures associated with that? And how do you handle those pressures? And you can also just hop right in. Um, there's no need to like raise hands or anything. Um, Jasmine, you can go. Go ahead, Jasmine. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, you can totally go first. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I am a first generation student. Um, and it, it's really difficult personally for me to be a first gen student, especially in a, a predominantly white institution, because that usually means that a lot of the times I am the one who has to go look for the resources that I need. My parents can't help me. Um, sometimes it's hard to reach out to certain professors because they can't help me. Um, it's hard to get even um, counseling because I don't know how to go about it. So it's it's been really hard for me as a first gen to really find and figure out my next moves. But I guess like the best part in my situation is that I'm not a firstborn. So firstborn, first generation students, I think in my opinion, have it a lot harder. Um, and I've had older siblings who are first generation students, obviously, but they have already gone through the whole college process. So I kind of have them to kind of ask questions and move around and um, figure out how to navigate the college system. But it's been hard for me to find resources. Um, especially because a lot of the times it's also uh, the language barrier between um, my parent, what my parents speak and then what I, what I can speak and how, I, how can I explain what's going on in my head and my life to them in their language. So it, it becomes harder um, as a first gen student, in my opinion. Yeah, and I, I'll add to that um, because similar to you, and was it Eli? Eli. Eli. Um, similar to you, I am a, I'm not a firstborn, but I am a first generation college student. And so I kind of experienced some of the um, struggles, but I, I feel like not all of them. Um, but one, one thing that I certainly noticed amongst myself and others that were um, in my program, sorry, somebody outside is like making noise. I hope that's not too loud. Um, but like the financial support, just being able to call your parent and say, hey, I have this random class fee that's $300 or, you know, some random administrative thing or, you know, some opportunity that you want to take part of that um, typically first generation college students aren't, aren't financially going to be able to do. Um, so that was something. Also, like the little things they don't tell you, um, like as a as someone who has now gone through college and gone through grad school, I now understand like how to talk to professors and even that it's important to talk to professors um, and learning how to like navigate um, majors and stuff like that. Like having that support um, as a first generation student is a lot harder, but it's also, it also made me um, much more interested in mentoring. Like I was a part of a program um, at Central Michigan University called Pathways. And it was a first generation program um, where we were, we would as upperclassmen mentor younger kids. And then as college students as a whole, we would mentor uh, Flint students and Harrison students. And it, it kind of gave me a sense of pride to say like, yeah, you know, I can do this. And so since I'm here and doing this, you know, you can too. Um, so yeah, that's my experience. Thank you. Anyone else could answer that question? Yeah, I could hop in on this one. 
Um, similarly, what um, Ellie was saying, the lack of resources. Also, my name is Natalie. Sorry, let me preface with that. My name is Natalie. I'm a third year student over at Sacramento State University on the West Coast here in California. Um, so kind of going off of what Ellie was saying earlier about resources, I feel like because there are so many resources, you don't know where to start. And that's where you lack resources. For example, um, looking at picking a major. I'm on the pre-med track and prior to entering university, I didn't know that I could major in quite literally anything as long as I fulfilled the medical school requirements, um, I would be good to go. But I kind of just knew the classic major in one of the sciences and then head to medical school. And so really just raising awareness that you can, you have the freedom to really pick what interests you. Um, and I think as a first generation student, it's kind of ingrained into us to just take the safe path, don't really venture out and just stick to the plan. Um, but it's okay to be unconventional. And sometimes we face these outside um, stressors like because the because our parents and our past generations, they haven't done it because all they had to do is survive and make it. We have the freedom. So it's kind of unconventional and we're going against the grain. And for a lot of um, people of color, you know, this is a very diverse call we're on right now. And so for many of us, it's it's seen as taboo to not play it safe. And so really breaking those um, generational curses or really just breaking the stigma of taking the unbeaten path and making our own. And it's okay to be unconventional. It's okay if it takes you five years to graduate. Um, secondly, not really knowing the path to grad school. Um, for example, in high school, the SAT was kind of just a thing that like I didn't know it held a lot of importance when applying to university. Um, so now I know going forward, like the MCAT is what I'm gonna have to take. That's the SAT for medical school. And now I know like looking back, hindsight's 2020, now I know how much weight the MCAT's gonna hold. Um, now I know how much weight, not only are my scores gonna hold, but activities, are they impactful? Um, and those are just a few of the things that now I get to, after going through it, I'm going to get to share forward. Thank you. Anyone else want to answer that particular question? And we have yeah. many questions. So go ahead, Mindy. Sorry, I just want to add on really quickly. I definitely agree with everything that's been said. And like Natalie said, there are a lot of unique pressures being a first generation student. So I'm currently a rising senior at the University of Southern California, which is in Los Angeles. And I'm a first generation and firstborn student. And so I definitely know the relationship that you have as a student with your parent can be a lot. And a lot of the time that pressure is stemming from them. And so like Natalie said, a lot of the time you have the pressure to go into a really stable career, you know, the typical doctor, nursing, engineering, lawyer, that type of thing. But it is okay, once again, to go against the grain. You know, I was a nursing major and I switched to global health, was which was a hard transition, but and it was hard for my parents to accept that, like, you know, to be honest, but at the end of the day, you're the one that's going to have to clock into the hospital. You're the one that's going to be having to take the nursing courses. It's your life to live. And I know that's hard to accept. And for me, when people told me that, I thought, yeah, but you don't understand what it's like, you know, like you don't understand what it's like to go to my mom, try to explain what global health is. And there's that language barrier, once again, that Ellie was talking about, like, I can't even explain to her fully what it is. But at the end of the day, I made that decision still. And it was really hard. You know, I still think about it. It was a defining moment in my college career, but I'm really glad that I did it because like everyone says, follow your dreams, like you should actually do that. And it's okay to go into college and go on the medical track because that's what your parents want and then switch on your junior year. Like Natalie said, stay an extra semester. Like your path is your path, first of all, that's all I wanna say. And another thing is, I think being a first generation student definitely comes with a lot of downfalls like we've said in the past, but I also think it's taught me to be really independent. I've learned, the value of being alone. And a lot of the times, like I go to a predominantly white institution, sometimes I don't wanna be around those type of people that can't relate to me. And that's why I seek out the people that can. And so if your university offers those resources, maybe like a workshop for first-generation students, you don't even have to go there and mingle with the professors or whoever's holding the workshop. 
but maybe if you want to connect with the fellow students so you guys can grab some lunch and talk about your different issues even things like that help you don't have to always have it in a structured format and just you know when you get to college you'll see you'll learn how to be independent and you'll learn how to be okay with that and you'll learn how to make the most of the resources available to you so mindy just dropped a nugget like she just gave us a t-shirt a hashtag your path is your path like that is some wisdom and i had to learn that myself and not compare myself to people who are also um right bianca she told my story too right and so that's that's awesome did anyone else want to answer or respond to that question before we move to the next question all right cruz take it away not cruz it was it's everett yeah. Question okay. Two. Uh, the question two. This is a two-part question. Um, so first, for those of you who are students of color, what mental health stressors do you face while pursuing your academic career? And then part two of that is, how do you cope with those mental health stressors? And then, like he said, you don't have to raise your hand. Just get in where you fit in. Yeah, I can hop in on this. Um, Oh, well, hi, my name's Nina. I'm a senior at Hampton University. My situation is very unique because I did go to a predominantly white high school. So transitioning to a historically black college and university, I almost felt pressure like I was not the best. Normally at my high school, I was the only girl, specifically the only black young woman in all honors and APs, graduated top 5% of my class, and then transitioning over to Hampton, everybody was like that. So for me, it was almost like imposter syndrome, automatically stepping on campus and being like, wow, I am not different whatsoever. I don't stick out in any way. And it was really daunting, especially freshman year when I unfortunately was like five hours away from home and I didn't really have the safety net of going back home to people who I was extremely familiar with. But the one thing that I can say and the one thing that I can say really helped me to cope with it is understanding that not only am I more than qualified to be in this position or else I wouldn't have been picked, but that I am extremely unique in everything that I do. I'm extremely involved on campus. I do well in classes, but I'm so much more than just a statistic on paper with regards to grades. And understanding that and surrounding yourself with people who understand that as well once you transition into college is so helpful. Yeah, I'll jump in. I think actually, Nina, you told my story um, because I went to a predominantly white institution. I was the only um, black girl to be in the top 20 of my class. I was one of two women of color at all to be in the top 20 of my class. Um, and then I ended up at Spelman where it's like everybody graduated at the top of their class. And not only is Spelman a HBCU, it's an all girls HBCU. <laughs> so even more so I was like, dang, I don't got nothing. <laughs> and, but, but I'm grateful for the fact that our staff members are very intentional about stepping in because they recognize that. Um, and so uh, the stressor for me Many of the stressors of being a student of color, I'm not going to say they went away, but they were diminished slightly mentally because I go to a predominantly Black institution now. And so I'm not dealing with many of those microaggressions that I was dealing with before. I'm not dealing with everyone looking at me when the Black question pops up. I'm not dealing with teachers coming to me to consult with me about how to teach their lesson, lesson about being Black. I'm not dealing with not learning about Black history. I'm not dealing with not learning accurate history in general. <laughs> a lot of those things which were stressors when I went to a PWI are no longer the case because I go to an HBCU, but now the stressor became at an HBCU, where do I fit in and what distinguishes me from all these other smart, pretty black women, um, which I think is unfortunate because I think oftentimes our society sets us as black women against each other to, to be like, you have to be better than her. You have to find your one up. You have to find your thing that makes you better. And I've just, what's helped me to cope with that, as Nina says, is just realizing that there is so much. I'm not just, this, this has taught me that I'm not just a pretty smart black girl. Like 
there's so much more to who I am, what I stand for, what God has purposed me for. And I think also what helps me cope with that is recognizing that what's for me is mine. So there's nothing that anyone can do or say or be or show up as that's going to change the fact that the, the things that are destined for me are, are like, they have my name on it. And there's nothing that anyone can do. <laughs> there's nothing that anyone can do or say or be that would change that. Thanks, Kayla. And Nina, I'm right. You're, you, I'm, I'm with you. Kayla, she said, put that on a shirt. Like you, you guys are dropping these hashtags and these shirt um, titles. And what that is saying is that you guys have adopted affirmations and phrases that help you mentally repeat those mantras, if you will, or those phrases or quotes, and they help to ground you mentally. That's what I'm starting to pull from the conversation. Um, did anyone else want to respond to that question um, too? The, yeah, I, I can jump in. I can jump in real quick. Go ahead. Um, uh, so my name is Tavion. Um, I am a senior at Missouri University, uh, which is here in Northeastern PA. Uh, so I think I had a completely like switched experience. I went to a very racially diverse um, high school in inner city Philadelphia. And then when I went to college, uh, I think my school was about 98% white. Uh, so it's like, like something crazy like that. Um, and, and, you know, to make you know, matters even more difficult, I think more than half of the people of color on my campus um, are on uh, sporting teams uh, and, I, and I play football. So. I think one of the problems that I kind of ran into just all throughout college um, is kind of feeling like I'm really like like standing out, but not necessarily like in a good way. Um, but like, you know, just feeling like I don't really have anybody I can go talk to like with these issues um, just because it's, and it's so it's so uncomfortable too sometimes. Like, you know, I would have moments where I'm like, man, I don't even know if I want to be here. And I wouldn't even know why, you know, because I wouldn't really talk to a lot of people about it. Um, but just like feeling uncomfortable and like, you know, so many like microaggressions, you know, people will say stuff and just like, wow, like, is that, is that really how you feel? Like, like while I'm right here? Um, and I think that was really tough for me because I just felt like I really had nobody to go to. Um, so like, I guess to kind of switch over to how, how to like, how I kind of cope with that. I actually started a black student union um, very recently, like last year, I, I co-founded with someone else. And what I want to do was really like create a space for people who are going through those similar situations. like. Like just talking, like just I feel like it's just talking to other people about the things they're going through, um, is so powerful and it just helped me out so much. So that's kind of why, like, I wanted to start, um, like to start that type kind of environment for people. Um, so yeah, I think for me, like coming from like being somewhere where there's a whole bunch of people that look like me, act like me, talk like me, and then coming to college where it was just not not the case at all, um, really kind of made me feel like I was in the bubble and like had to like keep myself in that bubble. Um, and I think just having conversations with people, um, with people who look like me and offering other spaces for other people to talk about these issues um, has really helped me personally. Um, and I think I just keep trying to go go back to when, I, when I'm trying to cope with things in the future. Yeah, um, I actually have a similar feeling of isolation. Um, before I attended Morales College, I was at a predominantly white institution. Um, and so uh, I had transfer credits to get to Morales, but while I was attending um, the school that I was, it, it felt like there was this sense of, you know, there's not really a space for me. It's like I was tolerated. Um, you had that airy feeling of where it's like, okay, they want to take my money. Um, but besides that, it kind of feels like this is not necessarily a place that's trying to nurture me or trying to fulfill or cultivate the type of things that I desire. Um, and similarly, the way I kind of resolved that was going to these spaces like Black Student Unions where it felt like I could be acknowledged or have that sense of home. Uh, crazy enough, this, this institution was in a predominantly Black city, but in that moment, it felt like I wasn't. Um, and it, it's that crazy feeling where it feels like you're almost trapped. And that's the stress where it's like, not only am I attending these classes and trying to perform high in this um, institution, it also feels like this institution doesn't care no matter what I do and what I do put forward. Um, and so that's like a really like awkward feeling to have where it's like, no matter how much I've attempted to put up success, it's not, it doesn't really matter. Um, moving on to Morehouse, you know, being at an HBCU, I have other stressors, you know what I mean? Things that also come up just being a general student, but 
And there are also stressors that come with, you know, just going to HBCU in the first place. But the types of situations that I find myself in are vastly different. Now it's like, you know, trying to fit in, trying to see where you can, you know, help adapt and cultivate other things instead of just, you know, trying to gain something for yourself. Um, but within that, that's another stressor. But that's basically it. Um, that feeling of isolation, I think, is something that a lot of students of a color kind of have an issue with. And it'd be great if that could, you know, it's great to find those pockets where that thing can be resolved. Thank you for sharing, Cruz. Amir? Uh, yeah, so going off what he said, so um, with me, it's like, because me going in, the, in the, the business world, that's a totally different thing. It's a whole nother animal, as you say. So it's like, I don't want to be, I don't want to have to change for, for no one, you know, just because, you know, you know, I'm just me, but like, sometimes you feel a little bit isolated a little bit because there's no one else like you, like around kind of, and it's in the middle of what Cruz said. Um, but somehow I just, I try to find a way to adapt and try to, you know, meet new people and everything and have new experiences. And um, yeah, basically that's it. I just try to, just got to adapt and just try to, mold in essentially even like even if you don't feel like you you know belong there like you fit in in the right you know puzzle pieces they say uh but just got to keep moving forward for me so yeah and sometimes it's creating that space awesome uh, who's next uh can i jump in sure so i also want to bring up um i think so i am a Fijian, half Fijian and half Polish, first gen and only child. So I think it's interesting because if we look, my heritage stems and I am Indian, right? Um, and we are known, anyone Asian, South Asian, we're known as like model minority. And I think what I kind of learned being in university is they'll give you enough, but they'll still not give you enough to level the playing field. Right. So I obviously cannot relate to anyone who goes to an HBCU, members of the Black community. I can't relate to you guys as much, but know that there's still a bit, right? And that is like, how do I say this? So I'd like to go to medical school. And we know that medical school is for the top bracket, tax bracket, people who make the money, who can afford MCAT prep courses, who can get into these like, these letters of rec from really top people and getting into these research institutes straight off their freshman year. Um, but I'm given just enough financial aid, given just enough opportunities, but not enough to where I can climb and be at the top. And so that has honestly led to a lot of imposter syndrome um, because, because being a model minority, I was only given enough to where I'm like, I don't deserve to sit at this table. And so I've kind of switched my mindset to be like, no, I deserve to be at this table and I deserve to eat here. And I'm sorry, but actually you can get my water for me because I am here just as much and I deserve to be here. <laughs> you guys are awesome. No, but truly like I, I deserve to be here and I will get to the top and eat at the same table as everyone else. And I can only hope that I could reach my hand down and pull other people up because as a model minority i don't think that don't literally just don't oppress us enough and be like look we're giving them enough and they could do it so why can't you guys don't use us as your scapegoat and i feel like as the entire government institution that's what they'll do they'll use us as a scapegoat and that's not right and she drops the mic literally Thank you so much for that. Like, let's like, like, can we just absorb that moment? Can we just like soak it in as a sponge, right? Cause there's tricks to this stuff and we gotta be cunning enough to identify the tricks of the trade, right? All right. Wow, Kayla, go ahead and take us into that next question, girl. Sorry, I was still basking. She said, get my water. Not not only give me a seat at the table, but get my water. And that love that. Love that. 
Um, so our next question for you all is, how do you deal with balancing your school life, balancing your school life with your social life or family life? And has that been a challenge? Man, oh man. Um, as a Hampton woman, the culture of Hampton itself is so unique in the sense of you, you're literally expected to almost be the head of multiple organizations, kick butt in all 18 credits, have a decent social life, somehow manage a job, eight hours of sleep, eating healthy and staying at the gym. And somehow you're, I don't know how people juggle it. I don't know how I juggle it. It's been a very big struggle. It was actually one of the biggest contributing factors as to why I almost like tanked some of my grades freshman year because I was so excited to just want to get involved and want to jump in. But I think it's extremely important when you go to school to really understand yourself and understand that your needs and the why you're at school are always going to come first with regards to balancing. I know for me, my parents just sat me down and they were like, we are not paying this large tuition for you to just go to school and fail. Um, and I think it's extremely important to also be sure to make sure like, of course, it's nice to join clubs and organizations, but also understand you don't have to be the head of everything. You don't have to do 10 billion different things and wear 10 billion different hats to feel validated. Do what you can and do what you enjoy. Um, I had to cut down on a lot of my leadership this upcoming year because I knew I wanted to just enjoy my senior year and I didn't want to be stressed out. And that's completely okay. If you want to be super involved, do it. If you don't want to be super involved, do that too. But at the end of the day, just make sure you're doing it for you. Make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and take care of yourself. That's the most important part. Yeah, so um, being a pre-med student, kind of like what Nina was saying, you want to wear all these different hats. Um, but honestly, the things that I do to balance is I actually use a planner and I use a planner religiously. Um, so these are more of like the small little like nitpicky things, um, but really planning out my semester and allocating enough time because some honestly some courses are easier for me and some courses are more difficult for me and really understanding who you are um for example i've heard that organic chemistry is really really difficult um but on the other side i've heard organic chemistry is really easy so gauging how you learn how much time it takes and setting that time for yourself um utilize that planner the google calendar um, secondly, echoing what Nina said, say yes to opportunities that you're genuinely interested in. Um, if you want to join like hammock club, do it. Like you don't have to be part of like medical brigades or like maps if you're genuinely not interested in it because you only have four years. So only do what you want. Um, another thing that has helped me is picking a routine and sticking to it. I like to wake up early and I'm asleep by 1030. So sticking to that routine is going to serve you well, especially when you're like your first year in university, everything's so frazzled. Um, and lastly, please don't compare yourself to others. Everyone's on their own journey and you're not at the same pace as a fourth year. I used to do that a lot my first year. Um, so really just, I guess, know yourself and don't compare yourself to others. I would say, oh, sorry, Jasmine, go ahead. You sure you wanna, you wanna even say your thing? Okay. Um, well, one, <laughs> well, I have a few things. So one was to really like be honest with myself um, as it came to like schoolwork. So honestly, like I'm a procrastinator and the, the sooner I got, my head around it the sooner it was easier to like change it or make it work for me um so what I mean by that is like Natalie like I am a planner I have my google calendars I have my physical calendars I have my different colors and I will you know do the whole thing and I will build in time to where oh if I have to study for an exam for a class I don't love 
um, I'm probably going to procrastinate. So let me make sure on the day I need to study, I have enough time. Like, <laughs> I'll just plan it like that. Or for like self-care, I'll block off my time with myself. No, I'm not available. I can't talk. I can't do anything else because I'm, I'm with myself. Um, as far as like the activities, because <laughs> I, I, I was one of those people that was in a lot of activities. I only did things I loved. Um, so it didn't feel like too much work. Um, like one of the most time consuming things I did, um, and I would say in undergrad and in grad school was work with like the black organization. So I was, you know, part of NAACP in undergrad. Um, at Harvard, I was the like leader of the black student health organization. And it didn't feel like work. It felt like, oh, I'm hanging with my friends <laughs> and I'm, you know, spending the university's resources to make sure black students have what, what they need. Um, so it was like fun. Um, I made sure I communicated with my family because like I said earlier, I have 11 siblings. So I made sure I like would, you know, group text people or try to have like three-way phone calls or let people know like, I'm not available, but I love you, you know? <laughs> um, like you might not understand what's going on, but you know, if and when you go to college, you will. And, you know, just kind of leave it at that. Um, I was I was a student who always had to work um, while I was in school. So I would <laughs> I would always like have a diversity related job and then have a research related job because of the field I was in. But I would always make sure that my time could be flexible um, just so that if I'm like overwhelmed or stressed out, I can just like not work that day. And somehow it, <laughs> it has worked um, and then sleep like. I will not pull an all-nighter like Kiara can tell you because we we would we would study together often, but I will not pull an all-nighter. Like it's never been worth it for me. Um, and honestly, like your sleep is the most important thing you can do for your health, um, for your body, for your mental health. And I I'll sleep. Yeah, so I they've already dropped so many gems. So I'll just add really quickly. Um, those who know me know that I keep myself busy, even when I'm not trying to keep myself busy, I keep myself busy. Um, and so there have been a couple things on top of, I mean, just, just definitely second everything that's already been said. But then there are also a couple things that help me. Um, one, I would say I'm almost the opposite of Natalie in that I can, I hate routines. Like, I think it, it makes me even more miserable when I do the same thing every day. So I'm intentional about making, making sure that I can like, okay, if I need to alternate between tasks or I'm gonna spend 30 minutes on this and then an hour on this, and then I'm taking a break. Like, because I cannot, I just, even as an, an honors student or whatever, they, they swear we study for hours and I can't. Like I lose focus and then I'm not hearing anything that I'm learning anyway. So I would say that's one thing that's really helped me is finding ways to create spontaneity, whether that be, like I said, I'm not gonna do, all, maybe I'm not gonna do this assignment all at one time. I'm gonna do this, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and then alternate that way. Something else that has been helpful for me is um, I communicate with all of my bosses and all of my teachers and all of my friends and everybody. And I tell them when I'm overwhelmed and when I'm having a hard time and when it's like, yeah, I don't think I can show up in these ways. And I'm very transparent about, about that. Um, and sometimes like they'll, or, or sometimes I even have people in these organizations, I'm, I've been very grateful blessed to work predominantly with nonprofits throughout my career. And so nonprofit workers usually are more understanding and empathetic in those cases. So I have people in, in most of my jobs and in most of my obligations that even will check on check in on me and be like, Kayla, you're doing a little bit too much. Maybe you should slow down. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't lead. Cruz will check in on me and be like, Maybe you shouldn't lead the third talk show in a row. Like that's a lot. That's a lot of work. <laughs> Um, and, and so that's helpful, like 
one being able to be authentic in the spaces that you step in. Um, I feel like any space that you're not able to tell them, I mean, other than classes, because I know professors don't be caring for real, but I feel like any other space that you add to your, um, that you add to your plate, if you're not able to tell them, I need a break, then you shouldn't be there because you're not really appreciated and nor is your mental health and nor is your energy. So like you, you should be able to say that. And then I think the last thing that has really helped me and this sort of ties into the last point is, um, is reaching out to people who I consider to be wise um, and asking what they did. Like, how did, how did you balance this? My mom actually got a master's degree uh, went all the way up to getting a master's degree. So talking to my mom, like my mom was in college with five kids. How you do that? <laughs> How you do that? <laughs> cause, cause I can barely manage myself, you know? So, so like gleaning from her also just, just talking to other, other mentors in general, mentors in different aspects of your life and be, and understand that not all of your mentors have to have a master's degree. Sometimes somebody who has very imp important information that you need is just like the janitor at your school or like, you, you know what I'm saying? So, so also finding information in places that are, that are um, in some ways unconventional has been very helpful for me and, and being comfortable speaking to my mentors and learning from them. Thanks for sharing that, Kayla. Anyone else want to respond? Does anybody else want to go? Because I slide in here and then slide on right out. Um, the common denominator, or at least from what I'm hearing and what I also agree with is comfort. A lot of that is what matters. Um, you have to find you know, what works for you. Um, for me, I am the opposite of Kayla in a lot of ways where it's like, nah, uh, I got these obligations and nothing else because I need my me time. Um, I, I totally felt whoever said it earlier, like with sleep. Oh yeah, I think it was Jazz. Um, the eight hours is important, like so crucial for me. Um, I turn cranky. I, I can't deal or cope with people if I'm, you know, irritated or anything like that. So it's like, nah, for me to deliver the best person that I can possibly be, whether that being, um, you know, paying attention and being active in class, whether that's being in different programs and clubs that I'm in, you know, to, for me to deliver all of that in the way that I want to, I had to like have that self-concern and comfortability there. Like I don't go to things unless I have a calendar invite or like something like that for it. Um, unless it's just like a spur moment, like I chose to do it, like I'm comfortable. Nah, if it's not in my calendar and you told me like, 30 minutes before, I can't do it. Sorry, <laughs> can't do it. Um, but it's it's having those type of energies and things that help you, you know, feel comfortable and help you operate in the best ways possible. That's what's really going to be important. And for everyone that's different, um, whether that's taking self care time to be like, yo, I need to meditate, zen out right now, or do some yoga, um, whatever it may be, um, find what that comfortability is for you. Thank you so much. So we're going to transition into our next question. Ever yeah, um, and just briefly before we switch to the next question, I just wanted to thank everybody um, who has been dropping all this knowledge so far. As someone who has not made it to college yet, um, it's just amazing to hear all of this like great advice, great knowledge that Char is sharing because I'm not gonna lie, it's scary. Like I'm afraid to like take to that next level because I'm not really sure what's there. And just hearing y'all say how y'all have, you know, gone through certain things and still prevail and are still like having great success. It's just amazing to hear that. Um, so with that being said, the next question is, this past year has been rough. How do you feel with the extreme racial tensions in this country while maintaining your focus on academics? Was it mentally challenging? How did you cope? That's the heavy one. Okay, yeah. All the racial tensions that we dealt with last year. Go ahead, Amir. Mm -hmm. uh, so me, like when I, um, I was just finishing up my, you know, like second year, you know, it's like, like, well, actually in the freshman year, but it's like, 
it was just crazy like the like the the tail events that happened like like you know closing down shutting down everything and then to have the, you know the whole george thing you know george point thing happened it was just my mind was like very very overwhelmed with like everything it was just filled up with so much like anger sadness all that you know just like it i felt kind of really hard to you know focus on my work because everything that was going on in the news cycle it was really hard to keep your mind focused on one singular thing so with me i tried to you know cut the tv off once in a while just sit there and just try to you know rest you know and say like eight hours of sleep that's the especially during that time, that was like real crucial to keep your mind fresh and keep it from, you know, going into, you know, depressing moods sometimes, you know, seeing different things happen to people, which should not be happening at all. And it's not right. But for me, it was just sitting there meditating, you know, trying to think of stuff. And for me personally, reading the Bible, all that type of stuff. So uh, for me, that was important in that time. From there, anyone else? Man, um, I think this past year was extremely trying. Um, especially Hampton did the entire year virtual. So even though normally on my campus, events like this are always a topic of conversation. And I love that Hampton is such a safe space for me, coming from a predominantly white area, to be able to openly talk about these issues and get my anger and frustration out. This past year was very trying. Um, it psychologically messes a lot of people up to continuously see Black bodies being put on the line when they shouldn't have to be. Um, rest in peace to George Floyd as well as Breonna Taylor. It, it was a very traumatic year. And I'm very appreciative that my university took a lot of steps after a lot of those events to really provide mental counseling, to provide us safe spaces in classes in order to really be able to get our anger and frustration and even fears and worries out as African-American students. And myself included, as well as like a bunch of my friends and colleagues and everything, we really had to engage in self-care that looked very different than what the aesthetically pleasing definition of self-care looked like self-care during that time wasn't, oh, let's go to the nail salon, let's go shopping, let's just sleep in all day. It was more of let's have deep conversations to get our anger out. Let's go to therapy so that we're able to really heal from this. At times, let's completely get off of social media. Let's get away from the news because it's very traumatizing to watch that over and over again, all on the news, every single news channel. And even though this year was trying, I'm very happy that there were a lot of things put in place to kind of recover, if that makes any sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, reflecting back, because I also was just finishing up my first year of university, and I can't believe the next time I'm going to be on campus, I'm going to be a third year. Um, but looking back, I just felt like it was one thing after another after another. Um, we had the Black Lives Matter movement kickoff, and not only was that gaining more attention, but the death toll from COVID was rising at the same time. And it's like, well, we need to get out there and have our voices heard, but at the same time, we're still spreading the virus. And it's like, what do we deal with? We're not only dealing with the death count from COVID, but we're dealing with the death count of people of the black community and for what? For skin color? Like as if we don't bleed the same blood. And it was frustrating as like a person just watching it on the news every single time. Like Nina said, it's everywhere you turn. I got tired of reposting flyers on Instagram and forwarding donation links to literally everyone in my contact list. So I really had to take a step back and just understand that I am doing as much as I can in this very moment and being the best ally and friend I can be to anyone and everyone. Um, but not only were we dealing with that, but we were dealing with an attack on women's health towards once it was near um, election time. Planned Parenthood was being attacked. And for a while, I genuinely, and I've never been scared for my own like rights as a person in the United States until our last presidency. And 
especially when we were on the verge of reversing Roe versus Wade. That was terrifying for me because I was just like, how are we going back in history? We're supposed to be progressing from such a like nation that prides itself on equality and equity for all people that includes all genders and skin colors. It doesn't seem like that right now. And of course, bleeding into 2021, there was a direct attack on democracy. And even bleeding into 2021, I was scared that, you know, everything, the safety was going to collapse. All the progress we made was going to just relapse. And so really just understanding that I'm doing the best I can. And despite like, I'm a pretty high achieving individual, especially in school and understanding that like, okay, getting that 80 on the exam was not the end of the world. Getting a B in the class is not going to tear all my chances away from medical school because look at all the things that I'm doing. Um, one way I coped again was I also created a blog and I was really like voicing everything on there. I took a linguistics class and I really understood the power of language. And one of my favorite posts was how the power of language affects communication towards everyone. And really just like pressing that and allowing people to like send in their thoughts and creating a platform where I could voice other people's opinions. And yeah, so just taking a step back and understanding I'm doing the best I can. Yeah. Um, oh, no, go ahead, Tamia. Yeah, I was just going to jump in really quickly, like just to add to all the great things um, Natalie and Eva just had to say. Um, but yeah, for me, it was definitely a tough time, like, you know, especially, you know, being Black, of course, on an all-white campus, but people don't necessarily think, you know, similarly to what I do, and probably not like uh, how y'all do either. Um, but like just the, like a little bit thing that something that's really helped me is, you know, of course, I love like having these type of conversations. I love informing Know, people who may not be aware about these issues um but something that really helped is just like recognizing that i don't always gotta be that guy you know what i'm saying like i don't always gotta be the person that's that gotta educate everybody about this issue especially just because i'm one of the, like a few black people i don't gotta be that that token black person you feel me and i think that um that that really helped me like saying like i don't i don't speak for all black i don't speak for all black people on this campus you know what i'm saying so like and just recognizing that like we all play like a small part into this progress. Like it's not just one, of course, you know, there are specific people who have like significant roles, but it's not just like us changing the world, like, you know, by ourselves. Like, like it's, it takes multiple people and just the accepting that like, I'm not going to change everybody's mind all the time right now, but that is, is, is multiple steps in this and I got to work with other people. So I think that's what really helped me out just understanding that I don't gotta be that guy all the time. Even if like people in the administration are like coming to me, like, what do black people think about this? Like, listen, like I can give my input about what I think, but like, like it's not like, <laughs> you feel me? Like it's, it's all of us that's really taking a part in this. So just understanding like and trying to balance those two has really just helped me, you know, balance with, you know, my life, education and what all the events that have been going on. Um, I was just gonna add really quickly, like it's really good that you guys are recognizing um, at your um, stage in life that you need to take a step back and that you're allowed to take a step back because when I was in undergrad, like I did feel like exactly like you guys were and it's like, here's all of this injustice and it's, it was more than just being from Flint and dealing with it. It was now I have like this much of a platform and I can do something about it and I'm supposed to do something about it. And I want to do something about it. And that's not how, you know, it works in real life. And it is stressful sometimes. And you do feel like everything does fall on your shoulders. And so this past year has been completely a step back for me. That's why I felt like I was so eager to engage with you guys, because this is a way that I can, um, I feel like do my part without being stressed out about it. Because the unfortunate thing is if you go to PWI or if you do, uh, you know, go to a school that is predominantly white in high school, once you get to being, you know, graduated and working, it is the same thing. There's these few people that you feel like are allies, but then you realize that they have their own biases and they don't really understand how to be an actual ally. And you're doing the same thing for them that you would be doing for these people who aren't allies at all. 
And so it's, it's like, I'm doing this at work. I'm doing this at school. I'm doing this with the leasing office. I'm doing this, you know, in every aspect of my life. And so it was, it was hard because I did feel like I had a lot to say about some of the issues and people were DMing me and asking me, well, why haven't you, you know, cause I used to, oh, I used to post so much, very long posts all the time and videos and all of that. So it's like people expected to hear from me about certain things and I didn't have the mental capacity to do it. Um, and I, I do think it was this year, but I think when I initially stopped doing it in the very beginning was when Trump got elected the first time because I was very disheartened. I felt like I had, I, I, you know, given my whole, like everything I could <laughs> to help and educate people. And I felt like it was in vain. And so after that, that's when I realized that, you know, it's not all up to you and you do have to take a step back for your mental health. So it was nice to hear that from, from Taviana and Natalie. And I just want to add in real quick. So Kiera is from Flint and she's in the DC area. Um, I think at Georgetown now, right? And she's doing, is it Georgetown? Um, so I did a graduate program at Georgetown, but I'm, I go to University of Maryland for law school. Right. So she's in, in law school. She's a law school major. And so Bianca is from Detroit. She's the other um, mentor for the FLIP program, and she's in the D.C. area. So maybe I can connect you guys to be. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. All right. Yeah, um, who was that? Oh, yeah. Put your information in, in the chat for her. Cool. Um, I think it's um, Kayla question next. And some of the people kind of went to the kind of bleeding. I'm, I'm only bringing bridging both questions because some of the responses are bleeding into COVID as well. So I'm go ahead and ask that question. And if anyone want to tag that onto the previous question, that'd be great. Go ahead. Okay. I was, okay. You want me to ask the COVID question? Okay. Yeah. So, um, COVID-19 made institutions of higher learning rethink its approach. How did migrating to all virtual learning impact you as a student, your mental health, and your academic achievements? And really quickly, while y'all think about your responses to that, I just want to add on to the last question, um, because I think the, I, well, I think one, I want to be very clear in saying I, as a Black woman, did not start dealing with racial tensions when the world realized that it was occurring. So like, I didn't, George Floyd wasn't the beginning of this journey for me. And I think that should be clear because I think we as a country, because a lot of people are just now becoming aware of this, um, pretend that it started last year. And it's like, no, <laughs> this happens every year. This happens every month. This happens every day and has been since I was born, since my mom was born, since my grandma was born, since the founding of this nation we have exploited people of color, more specifically black people. Um, and so I've been dealing with racial tensions in my life this whole, since I was born. <laughs> like <laughs> I didn't just become aware of race or police brutality or any of that. And I'm, I'm glad that many people are becoming aware of this conversation, but I don't wanna pretend that it started last year. And I know that wasn't your intention, but I wanna put that out there. Um, and for me, um, it, it was hard to, to just parrot what has already been said for all of the reasons that have been said. But I think on top of that, and I think it was Natalie that uh, went into this a little bit, I was dealing with racial tensions, but also tensions as a woman to, to and as a Black woman, and also recognizing the fact that our nation got upset over George Floyd, but not necessarily over Breonna Taylor. And we oftentimes do that with Black women. And so even dealing with that, like the, the, the fact that I, as a Black woman, although I'm 100% always here for Black men, I recognize that the nation wasn't here for Black women and Black trans women more specifically in the same ways that they were for George Floyd. And that is an issue. And I will always say it and I will always bring it up because if your Black Lives Matter doesn't have it all in front of it, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're not really fighting. You're not fighting the right fight. And we'll all still be, we'll still all be in bondage by the end of the fight that you're fighting. Cause then we're gonna have to go back and put asterisks on it. Like, oh, when, but I also meant, and I also meant like, anywho, 
that's a whole different story. But um, I, I think it's very important for us to recognize intersectionality and to recognize the fact that like there are communities who are dealing with, with, with tensions simultaneously and that also impacts the way that they show up in academic spaces. Um, I did have the privilege though of attending an all girls HBCU. And so we were able to have a lot of those conversations in class and I was able to learn from my professors and from my peers and have those conversations in ways that I wouldn't have been able to at a PWI. Um, and I think that is what really helped me was confronting it. Um, but also, as you all have said, is was stepping up when it was necessary, but also stepping back when I needed to. Um, and, and it's finding that balance that really helps, I think, social justice warriors in general with being able to sustain through the fight because it's not always your battle to fight. And that's something that I've been having to teach myself. Like it's, it's not, I cannot fight all the battles at one time because I'll just tire myself out and I won't be effective in any of them. So I think that's a very important lesson. Oh, so then I'm gonna repeat the question though so that we can all be on the same page. <laughs> The question was, COVID-19 made institutions of higher learning rethink its approach, rethink, rethink their approach. Um, what did migrating to all virtual learning, how did migrating to all virtual learning impact you as a student, your mental health, and your academic achievements? Yeah, so I would like to first start off by saying, um, as a super high achieving student, I remember that when I started off university, I had the mindset of I'm not going to miss class. And I honestly, I caught a really bad cold and I wouldn't be surprised if it was COVID um, back in 2019, October time. Um, but I still took my little butt to class because I was not going to miss it. And my professors were very clear, three absences, you're going to like drop, you're going to fail my class. It's in the syllabus. It doesn't matter. Um, and I think transitioning to online schooling really made it clear that education can be accessible to anyone and anywhere. And I think that opens the floodgates to are we are we allowing the equity of education to all students? Do all students have access to Wi-Fi? Because a lot of our stuff is internet based, you know. Yeah, we go to class and take notes, but you need to submit your essay on Turnitin you need to submit your lab online. Do students have access to that? Why do students have to wake up extra early to go to the computer lab on campus? So really it highlighted that education is accessible and we just need to work harder to make it deliverable to all students. Personally, I struggled going on like virtual because I like being in person. Um, it's very easy for me to get distracted if I'm in my like room. Um, or even just like at my house, because I'll like look to the side, I'm like, oh, wow, I kind of want to clean that right now. Or, oh, what's on TV? Uh, this lecture is recorded, I could watch it later. And so being really easily distracted and at the height of COVID, we couldn't go to coffee shops, we couldn't really study outside of our homes. Um, so what I did was really set up a study space, throw my phone into another room and just grind. Um, one thing I did like, however, is being able to access lectures after hours, because, for example, if you go to a class and your professor speaks really quickly, or there's like material that's genuinely like difficult, being able to go back and like pause, rewind. And I know for sure when we go back in the fall, I know I'm going to be sitting there at my desk and like pressing my desk, pretending like I can just pause the professor in real life, and that's going to be all bad. So I really do hope that going forward, they still stream lectures or maybe even create a podcast with the lectures um, to make lectures and information accessible outside of school hours and making education accessible to all students like they did. Yeah, I can hop in really quick. And I, I just want to acknowledge everything that Annalise said and I completely agree with. And I think for me, going virtual was really hard because I was actually a recent transfer to USC. So that was my first time ever being on campus. Before that, I was commuting to school. So I was really excited about getting that experience that all of my friends around me were like raving about for so long. And so when I got there, COVID hit, I had to leave about like a month in. 
And then I was virtual for a complete year. So, you know, I transferred to the university, but I've only been on campus for about a month. And that was really, really hard. You know, the transition to virtual school, I felt unmotivated and really disconnected, to be honest, because a lot of the learning happens in the classrooms and a lot of the connections you make with other students happens on the way to class or you're leaving the room, you hold the door open, you guys get lunch after. It's little things like that. And so I definitely acknowledge that it is really difficult. But one thing that transitioning to online school taught me is that college is not everything. And that sounds weird. And I don't wanna say that college is not important. It definitely is. And it's a great time to learn and grow and experience things. But college is only four years of your life. A lot of you are going to go to grad school. A lot of you guys are going to have amazing experiences after college. And so don't expect, don't go into college with expectations because you're going to be disappointed no matter what. If you always carry expectations around you. I remember when I went in, I thought, you know, I'm going to dorm. I'm going to make so many friends. I'm going to party. I'm going to do all of these things. Like I'm going to be a college student and none of that happened. And you know, it's fine. Like I'm still living and you know, what's great about it. I'm excited for after college because after college, I'm not going to be lost. I'm not going to be regretful. All of those things. I'm just going to be looking forward to the next opportunity. So I think that's always a great thing to put on your mind that college is just college. And, but like life is so much more than that. Um, I do want to, so this really just struck me as Mindy was talking um, the, especially like not having expectations going into university. I'm sorry, this is digressing from the question, but it's like really important to know. Nope, everyone tells you how exciting university is, how many cool things you're gonna do, but no one really lets you in that it's really lonely, especially that first year, because you're getting to like know everyone, your area and adjusting to the environment, you really, understand that it's a solo journey, take the unconventional path, like, and I guess because of COVID, that kind of got stripped away, um, all those experiences, but just really, yeah, just really understanding that it gets lonely, but you get to learn who you are as an individual, and I think transitioning to virtual learning, we got to spend time by ourselves and understanding who we are, what we like, what we don't like, what works for us. So we're going to take time for one more person to respond to the COVID question, and then Everett will ask our last question. And when he asks that question, we want to let our guests go first from the FLIP program, and then the FIRE youth will, FIRE interns will be able to go, even including the mentors, if they want to respond to that. One more um, response to the COVID question. How did you cope with the virtual learning? Do y'all mind if I go? Wait. No, no, somebody else. Nope. You got it. You got it. Okay. okay. Um, so personally for me, I think virtual transitioning to virtual learning was one of the most difficult things I've had to do. Um, I mean, I think I took advantage of when I was on campus, I took advantage of having a desk in my room. I took advantage of being able to walk from from building to building to be able to study there. Um, I took advantage of literally everything that the school offered. But when it when it came to transitioning to virtual learning, it was a complete mess for me. I didn't have a proper workspace. I didn't have a desk. I didn't have my own room to study. I it, it, it was just really difficult for me to really be able to pay attention in class. Um, I have like a full household and uh, on top of that, I share my room with my sister. So it became really hectic for me to be able to pay attention and actually succeed in my courses. And on top of that, it became really difficult when I had to explain my situation to a bunch of other professors who didn't understand that, who didn't understand that okay, my parents expect me that, well, expect that because I'm home, I can help them take my brother to school and I can help them get groceries in the middle of the day and I can help them do this, this and that. And my parents didn't understand at that time that I was a full-time student. My professors didn't understand at the time that I was living at home with, with um, you know, parents that were expecting me to not be a full-time student. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it became difficult when I had to explain my situation to professors and they didn't understand and they didn't care. And it, it really opened up my eyes when I had my own advisor tell me, okay, well, you only have like a, a one day, one extra day for an extension when I had my, that week was complete hell for me. And, and it was really eye-opening to me when 
I re- I realized she doesn't care about me. She doesn't care about my health. And just because she's my advisor doesn't mean that she has the best intentions for me. And then that's when I had to take a step back and I realized, as, as everybody else was saying, school isn't the most important thing. And right now it's my health. And right now it's me that's important. And that's when I you know, step aside. And I kind of started focusing more on my own health, but it was, uh, it was a terrible year for me. Virtual learning has been like super hard to, to really get a handle on. And, um, it's just, it's something that I would say that I've learned from this experience is to take every day, one day at a time, because for me, it was so difficult to plan ahead it was difficult to know how to how to move forward from i don't know what whatever i was facing but every day since since that day that my professor was just not being understanding um that's when i learned that one mentors sometimes don't have the best intentions and two take every day at a one day at a time um and that you matter you matter school doesn't sorry but you matter first Thank you so much. Anyone else? Uh, since you gave me the time, uh, no, I'm kidding. But um, one of the things that I had to deal with that was the most draining was that I used to sit in front of a computer screen like this for eight hours in a day. Um, I used to go to school and then I would have to volunteer online because I was a scholarship recipient. And so that that alone was like super draining in the case that like, I just hated the concept of sitting down for this long. Um, and then, you know, having to do that every single day where it was like, okay, you know, we want you to tutor these students. We want you to go to class, study. Um, right now, tensions are high. Your mental is crazy, but you gotta get it done. Um, and that was like, Oh my goodness, all that together out, out combined at one moment was like super intense for me. Um, and that was the moment where I was like, all right, you know, I gotta step away from all of this. Um, I used to like not touch my computer only when it came to school. And like, that was like a big deal for me. Before it used to be like, oh, I could sometimes use this for fun. Like maybe I watch Netflix or something. That became like, no, I need to escape. I can't deal with this computer screen. Um, I need to go do something. I need to go talk to somebody. I'm trapped in this house. Like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Um, and um, even when it came to like, the question that we asked before was, how are you dealing with these racial tensions? Um, I like to think of myself as an activist, but there was a time, the point where I was like, I don't wanna be in front of any screen. So I'm not gonna watch the TV and see news either. Whenever I pick up my, my phone for solace, it's, all these things that are harming me because I'm like witnessing these things where it feels like I'm experiencing these things. And it was like, I gotta just take a step back. Like, this is ridiculous. Like my entire life is now lived out through screens. And that that was like a, a issue that I thought I would never have before. Like, I, I'm gonna be weird and nerdy. I used to, I play video games. I, I used to think that screens was gonna be great. No. No, like I, it became like this evil thing to me. Like this, this is like a serious, like, yo, I'm used to these in-person interactions. I'm used to gaining this insight, these perspectives from, from speaking to people, you know, during those racial tensions, I'm like everyone else, I will speak to you about this. I did not want to speak to nobody at all. It was like shut down mode. I go to school, I wake up, I go to school and it's done and I just, lay in bed, like go to sleep. And this this rotation of this, like obviously became this thing where I had to like disrupt it. Like, yo, this is not comfortable. I can no longer treat myself like this. And that's where I had to shift to be like, all right, we want to take me time and all those different things. Um, but yeah. Thanks so much, Cruz. So Everett is going to um, give us our final question. Um, we're just asking for like a one word response um, no big, long, um, or deep, in-depth understanding, but I think that this question here is going to help a lot of people um, that watch the show. Everett, take it away. Okay, our final question is, what is the number one thing that you do to keep yourself mentally grounded? Sorry. 
set boundaries. Uh, practice mindfulness. like this might be cheating a little bit um but for me it's like like putting making sure that you're putting effort in like all the different spaces that you need to put it in in order to make yourself as happy as possible i feel like that was like a really like one sentence but knowing that like if it's if that's like you gotta make sure you're talking to your mom every other day make sure you're going to the gym three times a week make sure you're you know studying or make sure you're volunteering once a week but you have to do like those things, like just knowing what's best for you and like making sure you're you're checking those boxes essentially. Um, I'm just gonna say like be forgiving to yourself. Um, yeah, on that same thread, I would say releasing expectations. And I'll just say putting myself or putting yourself first in times when it really matters. Following that, I'd say um, spending time alone, reflecting, and checking in with yourself. Enjoy the finer moments. Someone on our in our um, Zoom audience off of Facebook said pray and having that time of prayer and meditation. All right, I'm going to ask for Bianca and Dana to give us some final words as we prepare to close out. Um, so I'll just say like I really enjoyed the conversation with all of you knowing that many of you are still in school even though I can't believe like I've been out of undergrad almost 10 years it's like shocking to think about that <laughs> but a lot of those things still apply to like things that I was going through when I was in undergrad and I feel like all of you just have like such a good mindset and you're moving forward in such a good way. And I would say anyone who is listening out there and watching this live or going back to watch this, like just take note of all the things that everyone talked about today um, in terms of especially like the one thing that I want to uplift is making sure that you're really doing things that you find joy in. Um, because I feel like there's always a way to make a career, to make a life about of the things that you find true joy in. Because if you find true joy in it, then you'll always keep searching for ways to kind of build and keep growing and keep doing that more. So I just want everyone to hold on to that. But it's a really great conversation. Thank you, Dr. Key, for inviting us. I'll first start by saying, uh, yeah, thank you to Dr. Key for inviting me and, and inviting the, the flippers. Um, this was a great session. It was, it was awesome hearing such wonderful words of wisdom from such young people, right? Um, and I think that you guys have it. You, you guys are going to carry us. Uh, and it's exciting to hear um, your, your thinking and your thought about all of these topics. Um, two things I, I'm going to uh, leave you with. One, um, I did want to acknowledge that 2020 felt more like a watershed moment in our history, in the United States history, um, from the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, the attack on Asians, um, and the attack on trans um, individuals. So it really felt as though everything was kind of crystallizing and coming to a peak in 2020, and then uh, carrying over to 2021. And we were all traumatized in 2020. Um, we were all dealing, it was a global trauma. And I do want to acknowledge that and um, how we experienced it, uh, um, it varies. Um, and, and I encourage people to talk it out. Um, the, the, the last thing, I, I didn't quite hear that last question, but kind of from the responses. Um, one of the things I want to leave you with is, is the importance of getting lost. That goes against everything you've ever heard in your life get lost and explore. You explore who you are and you explore the world. And it's okay 
not to know exactly where tomorrow will bring you. So explore getting lost and be comfortable with it. That's kind of weird, I know. But I always say I'm never lost because I just find new ways. And in that exploration of new ways, I find new opportunities and new journeys that takes me into wonderful places that I didn't know existed before. So become comfortable not knowing your way because you will find a way. So I thank, thank you all you. for having me. Um, and this was wonderful. And I know that um, my social security gonna be okay, right y'all? Cause y'all gonna take care of this. <laughs> Bianca. Um, and again, if you are a, a sophomore in college and you're going into your junior year or are a junior, look up the FLIP program at the School, School of Public Health, U of M, um, Future Public Health Leaders Program. That's what FLIP is. Um, this may be a perfect opportunity for you to get an internship with the CDC and be housed at the University of Michigan, we want you to be. However, there are other universities, a couple of other universities across the, the country that also um, are flip sites as well. But this is an invaluable experience. So to our YouTube and our virtual family out there in YouTube land and Facebook land, we thank you very much for tuning in. For those who missed part of the show, we always post on our Facebook page, but we archive all of our shows on our YouTube channel. So that is um, FIA810. F-P-H-Y-A-810, our area code. Our, and so check on that YouTube channel as well. And you can also see all of our past shows where we talked about co our COVID camp mentorship. We've talked about um, intersectionality. I mean, we, you, you know, we talked about it, the reopening of schools. These young people have been on it and are doing amazing work. So thank you again for tuning in. We'll be here every other Friday at 630. You all have a beautiful, safe holiday weekend. Enjoy yourself and we'll see you next time. Have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. King.